What's your legacy play? I mean, if you could be defined by one event or movement or an accomplishment, what would it be? My guest this week, Chris Wright, a longtime senior executive in the NBA, was given an opportunity few sports leaders are ever afforded, the chance to take an expansion franchise backed by great owners in the game he loves and turn it into his own legacy play. A man of great influence and persuasion, here's Chris Wright, CEO of one of Major League Soccer's most admired and exciting new clubs, the Minnesota United. I have with me for this week's guest on Game Face Execs, uh, someone who I have admired for a long, long time in the sports industry. And when I was thinking about who would be a real gentlemanly voice that I could bring to the conversation, Chris Wright came to my mind immediately. Chris Wright is the CEO of Minnesota United Football Club, uh, based in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and a longtime, well-respected sports executive. So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Rob. And I, I really admire the backdrop that you've created for this call today. Um, so you're all branded up. You've got a Ronaldo jersey going. Um, you know, it's so good to see you after uh, such a long time. Well, thank you, Chris. And yes, for those who are only listening uh, to this podcast and not watching, you're missing out, aren't they, Chris? Yes, they are. <laughs> Beautifully done. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Chris, I want to get right into something that's on the minds of everybody, whether they're into sports or not, the, uh, the progression or the digression, depending on how you look at it, of the sports industry over the last 12 or so months has been historic. And uh, you who've had a, a multi-decade career in the sports industry, and we'll talk about that here, you have a unique perspective for a number of reasons. But uh, as a leader of an MLS club and a, a leader of one that's fairly new inside the league, um, I'd like to get some idea from you on what it was like back in the spring of 2020 when the virus started to spread around the country and we started to take immediate precautions and your season, which had just launched, was kind of pulled out from under you. What were those conversations like with the league, with your fellow franchises and also with your team, your staff. To set a, a sort of a context for you, Rob, uh, we opened the 2020 MLS season on the road, and we played two games. We played one in your old city, uh, Portland, uh, and then we had a second game in San Jose. The game in San Jose, we uh, were due to play the um, uh, the Quakes there on a Saturday night. We landed on a Thursday, and uh, immediately that we landed, we we heard uh, that the, the um, the San Jose Sharks versus Minnesota Wild game, ironically, uh, was in jeopardy for the Friday night because uh, this thing called COVID-19 uh, had, had found its way uh, to the San Jose, San Francisco market, and it had become a hotspot. Um, we very, very quickly began to work with not only the Quakes, but also the Wild and the Sharks and uh, city government. Um, in San Jose to really begin to understand whether or not that game was even going to be played or not in that the mayor had walked to a podium and basically said um, they were going to shut down all major gatherings inside of the market. Uh, in the end, the wild game got played. Our game got played on the Saturday night. We got on a plane and came back and we were celebrating actually starting the season off 2-0. Uh, and we'd arranged a meeting for our players with all of our owners in a hospitality area of a building uh, in downtown St. Paul. And we had an incredible night that night celebrating um, our fourth season uh, and, and the incredible start that we had made. Three days later, uh, we were told to shut it down. Uh, we were told to shut it down by our league, uh, by our city, county and state officials. Uh, and really we pulled an all staff meeting together back then you were not socially distanced you weren't wearing masks you had really no idea of the protocols that were going to be put in place very very quickly we gathered everybody in a room inside of our office and we said okay starting tomorrow you'll be working from home here's the it department whatever you need please go to them we'll begin to work through that process with you um and so as quickly as we were euphoric about our start to the season, 
three days later, we were shutting everything down, our training facility, um, our offices, our stadium, et cetera, because we really did not know, uh, you know, the uh, anywhere near the knowledge that we have today about how COVID spreads. One of the very, very first things that we had to do was decide the cadence of, of meetings that we were then to have with all of our 120 employees and our players to really give them all of the information that they needed to be educated about what was going on, not only in the Twin Cities, but around our league uh, relative to the pandemic, the precautions that they needed to make. Testing protocols were starting to uh, be developed at that point. Um, and it got very, very complicated very, very quickly because we never really knew then um, our home opener got canceled. We didn't really know when we were going to play. And really two months later, when the, uh, the MLS established a bubble in Orlando, even as we went into the bubble to start off our season, we never really knew whether or not we would be coming home to try and finish out our season. So you can imagine um, all of the things that an organization has to go through to be able to manage those circumstances. And here we are today getting ready for um, our fifth season. And today we still don't know whether or not uh, on April 17th or whenever we play that home opener, uh, we still don't know whether or not there will be fans inside of our stadium cheering our team on. Well, the, uh, the, the Minnesota United had a fantastic opening in 2018, uh, 2019. In fact, um, ESPN gave you quite an award. Can you share with us that award? Because you had such a great momentum going before this really, I don't want to say it derailed your, your, your momentum, but it certainly uh, didn't make it easier for you to continue the momentum you'd been building up. What was that award that ESPN gave your, your franchise? Yeah, so we worked very hard, Rob, to um, really open Allianz Field, our stadium, our brand new 250 million, 20,000 seat purpose, purpose built soccer stadium. Um, we worked very, very hard to launch it, um, you know, in what, what I consider to be the right way. We had a tremendous number of events leading up to the opening of the stadium in 2019. Um, we actually went into every space and, and brought all of our clients into every space and, and created an event for everybody all through the stadium uh, to be able to sort of look at their experience, feel their experience before we actually even played uh, a game inside the stadium. And that's difficult in Minnesota because we get snow. Um, and um, yet we created some really remarkable events and, and sort of uh, the baptism of the stadium was, uh, was, was wonderful. We worked very, very hard uh, on our overall game day experience. We, we actually have our uh, supporter section is called Wonderwall. Um, when we win games, um, 20,000 people inside of our stadium sing an Oasis song, Wonderwall. Um, that's a big tradition inside of our stadium. And we have multiple traditions that people really resonated um, around that are truly Minnesotan. Um, uh, ESPN does a, a survey analysis every year. Um, and we were fortunate enough to win um, you know, the best stadium experience in the MLS of 2019 as we opened the stadium. Uh, and that comes with, um, you know, people working very, very hard, but listening to your consumer, listening to your fan base, the key stoke stakeholders of every area, delivering on an experience that you know that they want for the investment that they're making um, inside of your, uh, your, your club. Uh, but we were, were fortunate enough also to have a winning team that year, and we went to the playoffs for the first time. So that all sort of built towards this incredible crescendo uh, at the end of the season when we played against the LA Galaxy and uh, Ibrahimovic, uh, which ended up being his last, you know, it, one of his last games inside of our league. Unfortunately, we lost that game. But it set the tone uh, really for our franchise and the expectation of where and the vision for where we wanted to take this club longer term. So we, we talk a little bit about the pandemic and how that created an instant pivot for you and your sister clubs around the league and in sports in general, obviously. But something else happened in 2020, specific to your market. 
as everyone knows, uh, back in the summer of 2020, um, riots broke out in Minneapolis because of uh, because of uh, the the situation that happened there. And uh, so now we're, we're talking about a market, the Twin Cities, that not only has the pandemic, but also became the epicenter for social and civil unrest. You have been a life, not a lifelong, but you've been a longtime resident of, of the area. You've been in that community for a long, long time. I just want to know from just from a, a, a perspective of a resident and one who makes his living downtown, what was going through your mind and your heart when you saw these events unfold last summer? Well, as, as an individual club aside, um, I, I was devastated, uh, number one, that there was another loss of life. Um, I felt awful that uh, this was happening 11 miles away from where I lived. It was about 11 miles from our stadium and 11 miles from, you know, where Walla and myself have a home um, and have raised our three kids. Um, and uh, as much as I deplore um, what happened to George Floyd and, and many others uh, before him and some since him, um, it was a massive wake-up call um, for me as an individual, um, my family. It opened up incredible dialogue uh, with my kids, with my circle of friends, certainly inside of our club, certainly inside of our player circles. Um, and in the end, you hope that the tragic loss of life, uh, and it was tragic, um, leads to some level of deeper understanding and thinking about really what is going on inside of this country today. Um, at times, the country is very divisive um, and, and there are extremes. Um, the middle ground where people, uh, for me, uh, are able to engage in dialogue and be accepting of dialogue and be accepting of opinion that might be contrary or different to yours. Um, the art of that, Rob, to a degree, um, I think has been lost in certain areas of our country. And um, I've endeavored as an individual and I've en endeavored with my family and my circle of friends and our club to really sort of begin to address it in a really meaningful way. And I'm not saying that we never addressed it in the past, but what is it very specifically that we can do as human beings to really try to bridge this chasm? Uh, and, and it really, yeah, yes, in this particular case, it does speak to the African-Americans and the black people who live inside of our country and are our neighbors and our friends and our players, et cetera. But it also, for me, it also goes deeper um, into um, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of lifestyle, um, are we inclusive and do we provide an inclusive environment for everyone? Um, and how do we open ourselves up to uh, really think about it in, in that way? Um, so it was devastating because it was really in our backyard and it had incredible ramifications to us as a club and as a team uh, and to our location in the Midwest. And I have to assume that because uh, it originated in your market, um, that as one who runs a sports franchise within that market, where you are, are inviting tens of thousands of people to come enjoy an experience together, both as families and as companies, uh, that it gives you certain challenges and opportunities when you do reopen and those people are able to come back, maybe, maybe in part or in whole. So give us some insight as to what your franchise is doing and how you're leading this effort, Chris, to prepare for that eventuality in light of everything that's gone on in the last several months. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's, uh, we, we, we would need hours to talk about this, Rob. Um, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the top line for, for me inside of our club. Um, there were a number of different things. Um, we, we have nine black players on our roster. Um, we immediately put them together as a group. They came together as a group. 
And they approached me and said, Chris, we want regular meetings with you because we want to understand, number one, what is your philosophy and what is the club's philosophy? But then also, what are the action items and what are the things that we can build out together that can eradicate um, you know, racism inside of our club, um, our market, um, throughout the nation, et cetera? What is going to be you know, our, our role? And they really helped us identify a number of different things that we weren't doing that we should have been doing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I give them all of the credit in, in the world because they worked very, very hard on educating us about what it was really like to be in their shoes. And, and I, I, I don't think any of us who are uh, Caucasians uh, can really sort of understand deeply, have a real deep understanding of really what um, African-Americans and, and black people inside of our country go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so one of the things that we did that was very unique, Rob, which I'm, I'm not sure that many other teams did around the country. Most teams came out with um, a DEI statement that, um, you know, th this is who we are, this is what we believe in, et cetera. Uh, we, we said that we want to be really authentic about whatever we do and whatever we say, and we want this to be really sort of meaningful and we want people to understand why we're doing it this way. So for about a two month period of time, what we did was we gave all of our social media channels over to our players. And so whether that's Twitter, uh, whether that's Facebook, whether that's Instagram, um, whether it's um, articles on our own digital space, our website, we said, we, we want you to help us with and control the content from a messaging standpoint. And on, honestly, they, they so appreciated that. And, and it, it, it came from a point of view of, I'm not qualified to talk about what you're going through as a human being, as an individual, with your families, with your circle of friends etc. I can't talk about your history. I can't talk about things that have happened to you in your life. You can tell that story. Um, and I've, I've got to tell you, we have some young uh, black players on our roster who are incredibly well-educated, beautifully articulate, uh, that wrote some editorials uh, for people to read that um, would, would make you cry. Uh, they, they, it would make you have tears rolling down your face. And I think in the end, because we became good listeners to them, everybody in our market in the end said, wow, you know, this is, this is different. It's not just a statement from the team. It's allowing the members who have been impacted by racism inside of their club, let them be the voice. Um, and, and even now with Black History Month this month, and I don't know exactly when this is going to wear, um, you know, th that same group of people are providing the majority of the content for us to go out and celebrate Black History Month. So um, that's just one example. Um, you know, there are many other examples that I, I could bring, but that is the most meaningful example of the way that we have looked at it, treated it, and tried to be authentic around the issues that exist inside of um, you know, that world. Chris, obviously what you just described is, uh, is something that you're doing internally as a club to create a culture um, that is full of openness and transparency. And, and I appreciate that example that you shared with us. As we consider the fan experience, which you've been awarded for and you're noted for throughout the league and throughout sports, uh, there's some very unusual challenges coming your way because of safety concerns related to the pandemic and distancing, but also safety concerns perhaps to going to a downtown location. I don't know if that's true in your case, but can you speak to that a little bit about some of the plans that are being put into place for Alliance Field that I know that you can't share everything with us and I know it's constantly changing, but any insight you can give us so far? Yeah, and what I, what I do, Rob, or what I try to do is lean into philosophically where we are as a club on, on all of the above. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples relative to, to racism and the treatment of racism and, and how we can utilize our stadium 
as an opportunity for healing, um, uh, inclusivity, um, diversity. Uh, when I first got to the club, you, you know that I'm a, a pretty avid reader um, and I'm a huge fan of uh, Simon Sinek. Um, I'll read anything that this guy sort of puts out. I listen to his podcasts, etc. cetera. Uh, but I've always been a big believer in his book, Start With Why, uh, that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, and w- what I did when I first got to the club, I, I put about 72 people through a two-day workshop, uh, 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 the uh, Brave New Workshop, John Sweeney, comedian, uh, helped us with it. And it was a, a fascinating uh, opportunity for us to all get on the same page relative to this one question. What is our club's why? What is our purpose? Yeah, we're a soccer team. and Yeah, we're going to build a stadium. But really, truly, what is it all about? And one of the things that people fail to understand about the Minneapolis marketplace uh, is that there are 251 languages that are spoken here. So if there are 251 languages spoken and dialects inside of our market, that means that All of those good people came from somewhere, whether you're first, second, third generation, you arrived from somewhere around the world and you landed in Minneapolis and you, Minneapolis St. Paul, and you made this place your home. All of those people have a history in our game, in the beautiful game, the great game, the world's game. Um, And so we came out of that meeting with a why that was through the world's game, through the beautiful game, Let's inspire and unite our community of 251 languages. So how do we make Allianz Field that? Wherever they come from, whomever they are, they are welcome, uh, they're embraced, they're part of our family, they are fans of our club. Our staff reflect those 251 languages. Our part-time staff reflect those 251 languages. Our food and beverage opportunities inside of our stadium reflect those 251 languages. So when people come into Allianz Field, it becomes this place where they're going home and they're coming together and they're united around being inspired and and uniting them around our brand. So that has resonated in our community in in the biggest of ways. And when you walk into our stadium and you see all of the different ethnicities uh, from people all over the world inside of our stadium, it really is remarkable. So I I honestly believe that although the George Floyd situation is a massive setback, it's a massive setback to that, that we as a club, because of our why, our purpose and the core values that sort of back all of that up, we're in a great place to bring those people back and say, we care about everybody. We care about, I don't care where you're from. I don't care about your religion. I don't care about your lifestyle. I care about you as a human being and as an individual, and we want you to come back and support your team. So that now that's one thing. COVID, on the other hand, um, is interesting because we have not, hosted one supporter for an entire season, having sold out Allianz Field, 20,000 people per game in 2019. So imagine our staff who basically won that award with uh, ESPN, (laughs) hosted 20,000 people for 19 games, and now have hosted a whole season on the back end of that with not one fan inside of the stadium. I I think that there will be some resistance in certain states where you have not been able to open your doors and welcome people back. I think that there will be some resistance to fans returning to games. The great thing about us, Rob, is that we know that it will be a ramp up. We might be able to host 2,500 people initially when we open our season, all the way hopefully to a full stadium by the end of the year. We have 15,500 season ticket holders, and we have 5,000 people on a wait list to become season ticket holders. So when you consider that, I think inside of those those season ticket holders, there'll be 2,500 of them who will want to come to games, that will live in that world and will be open to masking up, socially distanced, 
and want to be part of an Allianz field experience. And if for whatever reason uh, there are not, then obviously we will go back to our group sales leads. We will go back to single game buyers. We will go down obviously the channels that you have worked in all of your life um, to see whether or not we can get to capacity based on whatever the guidelines that the governor gives us are. And we'll get back to our interview in just a moment. But at BMW, they didn't make just one SUV. They made the ultimate range SUV. With unmatched power, luxury, and performance, BMW X-Range is prepared for any road you travel. No matter who you are, no matter where you're going, no matter what's next, there's an X to take you there. My listeners, my audience, uh, Chris, needs to understand, if they don't already, that this is someone who's speaking not only, you, you don't speak off the cuff, you, you're a very strategic thinker, you, you plan well, and on top of all that, on top of your smarts, you also have a tremendous amount of experience and history in that market. So you and I first met many years ago when you were the president of the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Lynx organization, the NBA, WNBA franchises. And you were in the NBA for 25 plus years. Um, and I think many people associated with the NBA thought you'd never leave. N not because anyone was pushing you out or wanted you to leave, but because you were, be you were becoming an institution. And I also want to say that, and this is for people who are maybe new to the sports industry or aren't in the sports industry at all. Historically, the Minnesota Timberwolves in particular, when they began in the 80s, they began to produce talent out of the front office, out of the business office that was spreading throughout sports and making a tremendous positive impact throughout the industry. And you were right there in the center of it all. You were training, you were mentoring, you were identifying good talent. And you and I could talk about names for another hour that came out of your system and the system that you helped build. So can you help my audience understand today, why would you leave such a great environment, such a comfortable, if I can use that term, situation with the Timberwolves. You have a wonderful relationship with the owner of the Timberwolves and the Lynx, Glenn Taylor. Why would you leave that to go start up an expansion franchise across town? It's a great question. It's a, it actually is a really good story because I, I started off in the beautiful game. I, I played a little bit in England and then I got injured and I coached over there. And then I came to the United States and worked for Edward J. DeBartolo who owned the San Francisco 49ers, P Pittsburgh Penguins, and he bought a soccer team. Uh, he needed a general manager. I was the guy that he chose, and he gave me a PhD in, in running a professional sports organization. And from there, I, I moved to Minnesota to work for Joe Robbie, another NFL owner who owned the Miami Dolphins, uh, and actually uh, worked for him, and then actually closed the Minnesota Strikers down. Um, I did work for Rudy Perpich, the governor of the state of Minnesota, for a little bit, and we built something called the National Sports Center uh, up in Blaine, Minnesota. Uh, but then um, the NBA expanded to, um, to the Twin Cities, and a really good friend of mine coming out of soccer, Tim Lywicki, um, basically got the, the job as the uh, vice president of sales and marketing for the Minnesota Timbers, and he said, okay, right. Uh, come on down. So I, ironically, I was on a Zoom call with him last night and we we're telling a lot of the stories from the early days. But you, you're right, the names that came out of that franchise were incredible. But in 1995, the, uh, the, the franchise almost moved to New Orleans uh, and um, uh, a, a white knight on a big white horse called Glenn Taylor uh, rode in from Mankato, Minnesota and uh, uh, took the franchise away from Bob Arum uh, the uh, the boxing promoter who was trying to buy it and move it down to New Orleans. And, uh, tw you know, about 12 years in with Glenn, he made me the president of the team. Um, and then I was the president for about 12 years, the last 12 years that I was there. Along the way, Rob, I had I tried to encourage him to look at other investments in different sports teams and try to do what a lot of professional franchises have done today, which is really grown their stable. Of, of different operations. Um, there are so many synergies that uh, evolve when you've got multiple properties. Um, and I, I tried often to encourage Glenn to um, get into soccer, uh, but mainly European soccer, where I've, I've got a background and you know I know a little bit about what is going on over there. And um, about five years ago, um, a group led by Dr. Bill McGuire um, wanted to apply for the expansion rights for Minneapolis, and they went up against uh, the Wilf family who owned the Vikings. 
uh, to see who would get the rights. And Glenn said, you know what, if, if, go and meet with Bill and let, let's see if you can get me as part of that group. Uh, let me uh, be one of the investors in that group. You've always wanted to be in the game. And, and now you can look after my investment in, in the game. Um, and so um, I did. I, I met with Bill and in the end became part of a group that put together the, um, the presentation to Don Garber and the expansion committee inside of the MLS. And, you know, we won the rights to bring the franchise here. Now, then I went back to my day job, which was running the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Minnesota Lynx. Uh, but as, as we went down a path with Bill, it was obvious that there are only a couple of real opportunities that franchises have to establish themselves in markets and, and gather a share of voice in a very cluttered market. We're the 15th largest marketplace in the country. We have all of the different professional sports leagues here. We have minor league baseball here. We have a, a, a division one university in downtown Minneapolis. And we're a destination for all of the major events uh, that happen around our country. So it's very, very competitive. Uh, and the ownership felt that as we uh, started to go down a path of securing the site for Allianz Field, that they wanted somebody experienced to really run uh, the franchise, build a team, build the business, and then build the stadium. Um, and Glenn said, Chris, you know, this is an opportunity for you to return to your roots. Uh, the game that you love, the game that you're passionate about. What an incredible legacy play. Uh, this could be for you. So I met with Bill McGuire. I met with the Pollard family, who were also big investors in uh, Minnesota United. And in the end, I decided to accept the role as CEO, their first CEO uh, of the team. And now I work you know, day to day with the Pollard family, with Glenn Taylor, with Bill McGuire, um, and this incredible group of owners uh, that have been put together that have vested in the MLS inside of our market. So now that you're in MLS, you've been in it now for a few years, you've really got your hands dirty, so to speak. What have you learned in the MLS that has kind of surprised you in Major League Soccer that's kind of surprised you? And you think, you know, this is something that maybe my former league, and I'm not picking on the NBA, but this is something that this major league, the NBA or the NFL, because you have relationships there as well, that perhaps they could learn from the major league soccer experience. Is there, is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a number of things that I would, I would say. Um, I, I think that the, the incredible thing about the MLS is that it's just celebrated its 25th anniversary. You know, we're going into our 26th season. Well, think about the longevity of all of the other leagues and where they were at after 25 years as compared to this incredible beast of a league that is building stadiums everywhere, purpose-built stadiums everywhere. Um, the crafts are, are trying to figure one out in, um, in Boston. Um, New York City Football Club trying to figure one out in New York, as well as all of the expansion teams of Nashville, Austin, St. Louis, the potential of Sacramento, uh, Cincinnati, ourselves, all building purpose-built soccer stadiums. The, the development of the stadiums, and generally speaking, Rob, the land around it is providing incredible opportunities for this to go again. Also, when, when you think about the World Cup and the World Cup coming back here in 2026, it's going to be an, another incredible opportunity for once again to grow the game dramatically. Sometimes I don't think in other leagues you've got these major sort of uh, tentpole events that come in that basically are out of your control to a degree that are going to elevate the awareness, perception, following of the game. So um, I'm not sure that those exist. People might say, well, it's the Super Bowl does that or uh, the NBA championships do that. Well, we also have our championships uh, that are, are relatable to those big events inside of those other leagues. But I would say that also from a participation standpoint, the MLS franchises, uh, everybody that I talk to in our league is vested in growing the game. Mm. They're all vested in young players, male and female, the growth of the game. They have the growth of the game at heart. 
And not always do you necessarily see that in all leagues. The NBA did. Um, but um, the amount of opportunity, resources that you pour into the development of the game itself and the young lives that are looking for a sport to be able to play uh, is remarkable. And now with the advent of all of these young American players now being farmed by your top European teams and playing over there, well, watch out in 2022. But when we play in 2026 and Christian Pulisic and Reina and everybody else, Dest, and all of the young talent that is now um, on Greg Birdholder's team and squad, watch out if they make some noise in the World Cup in 2026. So th there are some amazing things happening inside of our game that I, I don't necessarily believe are, um, are happening in a lot of the other professional sports uh, in the United States. I have to attest to that because you mentioned that the MLS just celebrated its 25th anniversary. Not to put myself in that same class, but so did my business. And the reason I say that is that Game Face, uh, in our first or second year of business, we were invited by Major League Soccer when it was just 12 franchises yeah. to work with those initial 12 and building their sales operations. And so we were, as Mark Abbott, one of the one of the founders of the league, as far as writing the original business plan, today the president of Major League Soccer, not the commissioner, but the president, uh, he, he called us the, the official sales coach of Major League Soccer, and we we held that role for about three years as an advisor, a consultant, trainer to the league. Now it's at 27 franchises with three on the horizon. So it's just a couple of short, really, of all the other major leagues. So that growth you spoke of, it's real. It's impressive. It's uh, When I think back to those original owners, the Anschutz, the Hunt family, when I think about their vision for, for this sport and their commitment that they were going to make it work Come hell or high water, they were going to make this thing work. It wasn't going to be the old NASL. It was going to be Major League Soccer. What a testament to their vision, to their commitment, to their resources, and all the people around them, including, as you mentioned, Don Garber, today's commissioner, and the fantastic job he's done. Yeah. Hey, a quick time out here to say thank you for being a part of our growing audience at Game Face Execs. And before we get back to more of our interview, Please know that if this is the year you're ready to turn your sales or service staff into game-changing professionals that your customers or clients will love and want to talk about to others, I would welcome a conversation just to explore how I might assist your efforts. No heavy-handed techniques or tricks, just an open dialogue about how you want them to sell and serve your clientele and how my training could be the approach they've been looking for. Go to GameFaceSync.com right now or after this episode and let's connect. Your people and customers will thank you. And so do I. But I have to ask you now, let's, let's come back a little bit to reality after all of those accolades. All of sports is suffering right now in that we don't have any attendance going on, uh, so, you know, largely speaking, because of the pandemic. Uh, television ratings have been going down pretty dramatically in sports. The Super Bowl, uh, which recently was aired, had a, about, a, about a 15 year low in viewership. So what's your prescription, Chris Wright? Uh, as seasoned as you are, what is your prescription to draw people's attention back to sports, not only in buying tickets, but also sitting in front of the television and watching like they used to? Yeah, and I, th I, think, um, I think it's a great question. I don't know that there's a silver bullet, Rob, um, because I think that you've got to do an awful lot of different things right. Um, you, you, you've got to get it right. And, you know, we talked a little bit about purpose, our why. Um, that's got to be right. And that's got to underpin absolutely everything that you do. And you've got to believe in that so that the fan experience, when um, our fans and supporters do come back into our stadium, the fan experience has got to be absolutely exemplary. We can never, ever lose sight of that. Going forward, it's also going to be a safe environment. And so you, you've, got, you've got to figure out a way to make all of your facilities safe. 
And more and more, there is science and, and different studies that have been done uh, around uh, large outdoor events. Fortunately, we have an outdoor stadium. Uh, but uh, I was reading a report the other day where uh, and I think it's almost a thousand different outdoor events since the pandemic um, uh, struck us. Um, there's only one that can be deemed a super spreader event. Um, that um, you know th this particular study was aware of or found. So we've got to educate our fans that the environments that we're going to create for them are going to be safe. And then, you, then you've got a chance, and then you've got to make sure that your product on the field of play uh, is exemplary. Um, and we, we don't have the millions and millions and millions of dollars of some of the other leagues to be able to spend on players. So it's really important that you have systems in place uh, that allow you to identify and, and then uh, target, identify, and procure talent that is um, additive to the way you want to play. And I think that the MLS style is growing. It's getting very, very much younger. It's getting more creative. It's getting more skillful and technical. And I think that the product in the end has got a lead. Then on the social and digital media side, the content that you um, – allow your fans access to, uh, behind the scenes access, the storytelling, um, the, the background of players, where they can, we have some incredible players from South America, and if people really understood um, where they came from and, and how soccer became their way out, um, really compelling content storytelling uh, around um, you know, our players particularly. But I would say that the biggest challenge for our league is really to find the balance between um, revenues that are generated by the league and local market uh, revenues. Right now, we're completely reliant on local market revenues. So last year, which was devastating, um, your reliance on those 20,000 people coming to Allianz Field. If you have a season where zero fans come in, you get zero revenue, um, obviously. Um, but you, you also, we have, we're in a fortunate place to have 74 corporate partners. We saved about probably around about 60% of the resources inside of those deals by really coming up with unique activations. Some of it community-based, some of it social media-based, some of it around our games that were all televised and some of the assets that we were able to control around all of the television games. But we've got to grow that support as well with our local partners. But I think that the league is, is looking at different revenue streams. Our television agreements are up in 2022. And it'll be really interesting to see by then where the rights fees go right now. We do about $90 million a year um, on an annual basis into our league, which is obviously then distributed down into the teams. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see where that goes, given cord cutters, given sort of um, the diversification of where people now are claiming the content, where they're going for content, it'll be very interesting to see where that, uh, that bar uh, that needs to be moved upwards, uh, you know, goes in 2023. I think my audience really appreciates this, this insight you're giving us uh, into the mind of a sports executive. So thank you for that, Chris. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment, but one thing I love about GameFace Execs is that we get to hear people's stories. There's a website I love to visit, Ancestry.com, where you can find different paths to uncovering your own story. From building your family tree or learning your full ethnicity, even making some awesome discoveries like some of the ones I've come across, finding ancestors you never knew you had. Ancestry has helped me connect to my unique story, It'll do the same for you. Learn more at Ancestry.com. In the few remaining moments that we've got, I'd like to ask you now about more Chris Wright, just the person. Um, however, I want to go back to your sports roots. You and I both know you were a keeper in soccer. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're a great keeper, but I got I to gotta think you were. So, Chris, here's a question. I, I, I like to have this conversation with um, – with students, if you were to pick one position in sports and turn that person into a, an executive after they retired from the game, mm. 
what what sport, excuse me, what industry, what position I should have said, what position is most likely because of their the characteristics inherent with that position, most likely to become an effective executive. So I wanna I wanna ask you, is it a keeper or do you have a you have a different idea? Well, um it's, it's a fascinating question, a great question, Rob. Um, and when I think of what Tom Brady has done with his career as a quarterback of the team, the, the only problem that I have with the, the analogy that you're trying to have me make is that Tom Brady is only on the field half the time. Mm-hmm. And so r- really, is he controlling the entire game? And mo- a lot of people would argue that he is. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, um, the, the defense is on for half the time, but the quarterback sees it all. Um, and he's got to make a lot of really tough decisions. He might call a play, uh, but he's got to be nimble. Um, you know, may, maybe, um, you know, there, there are things that open up in front of him that he's got to take advantage of rather than sort of uh, pull his arm back and, and make the play that was prescribed at that particular moment in the game. He's also got to be able to work in the pocket outside of the pocket. He's got to be able to run. He's got to be able to sprint. He's got to be mobile. He's got to be nimble. Uh, He's got to have one heck of an arm that executes, executes all of the different strategies that are put in place for his organization. So of all of the positions that I see in sports that I think would make a great executive, when you think of the traits, the skills, the techniques, and the execution uh, of all of those. I think probably a quarterback in football is probably where I would go. So you, so you were half kind of a homer. You said football, but then we all have to recognize you're talking about American football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I get into trouble with that all the time. I actually, um, I actually did a spot for um, Spire Credit Union in our market the other day, and. Um, uh, they asked me a question and I had the audacity to say, look, soccer is the real football. Oh. <laughs> football is not football. And they aired it. <laughs> and uh, I can't tell you how my Twitter account sort of lit up. <laughs> uh, I don't think we'll, quite, we'll cause quite the stir, but I appreciate that answer. Very interesting perspective. Uh, sometime offline, I have to give you my opinion on that. Thank okay. you. You're interested. Uh, second, kind of a personal question. You and your wife, Wally, your lovely wife, Wally, have been married for 37 years. I think it's 37. 37. Okay. And yet you are in an industry, Chris, where the pressure's on you to be at the facility, be at the venue uh, late in the evening on you know evenings, weekends, holidays. Then you got to be back at it the next morning running the business it's got to work. It's, it's, it's take its toll on a marriage. And may I ask for, for my sake, for my audience's sake, I, I am very fortunate, blessed to have the woman in my life that I do, who I've been married to uh, for just about 37, not quite 37 years. What's your secret? How do you and Walla maintain such a love affair? Well, I mean, another great question, Rob, and uh, I should bring my wife out to answer the question, (laughs) but I won't do that. Um, But I I, I think, number one, it's um, there are two things that I would talk to. Number one, you've got to find your soulmate and you've got to find somebody who um, really believes in you, but you also really believe in her. Um, And and after that, once you've found your soulmate, um, I, I, I hope that um, your listeners um, and viewers take this in the right way. But I, I am such a believer in purpose uh, and I'm such a believer in why. What is, what is your personal why? And so what we talk about all the time is what is not necessarily the club's why, but what is Waller Wright's why? And what is Chris Wright's why? And I can articulate it the same way that I can articulate my club's why. Uh, My my personal why is to live my life every single day through my three F's. My faith, my family, and my franchise. 
and they've got to be in that order. And my wife lives her life in exactly the same way. She lives her life through her faith. She lives it through her family. And she lives it through, she is in your business. She works for a company called Wilson Learning, uh, owned by the Japanese. And uh, they are uh, a training company in both sales and service and executive coaching. So the good news is that I have a wife who I go to bed with every night who uh, there isn't one problem that Chris Wright has that she can't have an answer for. <laughs> um, but synergistically, synergistically, um, when, when you are on the same page with your loved one, uh, the way that we are on the same page with each other, life is easy. It, it is easy because you've got your priorities right. So we can celebrate our faith together. We can celebrate our family together. And we certainly celebrate on both ends of the spectrum. She is really into MNUFC, was really into the Minnesota Timberwolves. But I'm also really into Wilson Learning. And all of the events that she's got to go to as well. And I'm there with her holding a hand. And that's where I play second fiddle, where she plays second fiddle at all of my events. But it works. That's the right advice from Chris and Walla Wright. Thank you for that. Chris, I wish we could talk longer. Um, there's so much more I'd like to inquire and learn from you about. And, and uh, thank, you for, thank you for your insights. Uh, thank you for being an inspiration to so many people. Uh, you've been persuasive in my career, and, uh, and I, I think that this conversation we've had will have an impact on others as well. So I wish you the best, you and your team. And, um, and any final thoughts from you, Chris? No, Rob, I, I just really appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's wonderful uh, sort of connecting with you again. And, and thank you for everything that you've done for my franchises along the way. Uh, and, and all of the experience and the professionalism uh, that you have brought to every single session, training session, uh, et cetera, that we have uh, uh, we've participated in. So I really appreciate you. I really appreciate Game Face. Uh, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Oh, thank you, sir. And uh, go Loons, huh? Go Loons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chris Wright, thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for being a part of this episode of Game Face Execs. If you found any of it useful or helpful, please rate or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I always appreciate you referring us to others as well. I'll see you next week. Until then, persuade, influence, inspire.